Hello, welcome to Wisdom on a Wednesday. Um, a little bit later than normal because obviously it's about 11.45 now instead of 11.11. So thank you for joining me. Sorry I'm late. It was like one thing or another and then a builder arrived and started nailing things to my roof outside. So I was like, I'll wait till he's finished nailing and hammering around. Um, and so I think in a way that's quite interesting in itself that a builder, you know, builders, they just show up. Um, and the thing is, you're so happy that they've actually shown up that you're like, okay, whatever, because if they go away now, they might not come back for weeks or months. And it is a glorious day for what he needed to do. So, hi, Elaine. Um, I can see who's there. If you have any questions for Wisdom on a Wednesday, post them below and I can just about see what they are. So, if you want to post those there, and I'll try and answer any that come through. This is week five of Wisdom on a Wednesday. Um, as most of you know, my name's Andrea Fawkes, and I do past life regression, inner child therapy, ancestral timeline healing, spirit releasement, um, and I sing light language codes for your awakening as well. And uh, my big awakening happened I think this is now my 19th year now since I had a big awakening uh, 19 years ago where I was rewired by star beings and had a real expanding consciousness and then that also meant I had to do a lot of emotional inner work and of course things always come in and we've still got to do emotional inner work we've got to look at ourselves but we're clearing those Akashic records out so what is today's wisdom on a Wednesday about um, hello William uh, well, it depends whatever questions you ask. I was thinking, considering, um, obviously last week I couldn't do Wisdom on a Wednesday because I had to go up north and deal with my elderly parents. So that's one subject matter we could talk about at some point, which is, you know, getting to a point where you have elderly parents, because I am an only child of much older parents. So my dad is like 92 and my mum's 88 and she has dementia. Um, so that comes with the responsibility, especially when you don't have siblings and you don't necessarily have a partner or children yourself. So, um, you know, you deal with these things and I think everybody goes through things in life that bring a curveball in. I think all of us have that. We think, oh, I can cope with this. This is, this is the known territory of life. I have, I have the ability to deal with this because I've dealt with it before. And then things come into our lives that are new to us and we have to reassess our lifestyle, reassess what we're living to actually deal with those things. So I think a lot of things in life are about how honest you can be emotionally about the situation you're in and how flexible to change you can be. And of course, it's a lot easier if you're prepared to do the emotional inner journey work on yourself. Hi, Ian. Um, I think the thing is, you know, when we get curveballs in life and things can appear to be going very easily, not sometimes they're effortless, sometimes they're not, but when you get a curveball, you really need to be able to go inside yourself or actually be visionary on the outside to look at what do I need to do. Most of the time when we need to surrender to change, Obviously, sometimes it's physical change, but often a lot of the time what we need to surrender to is emotional change. And to me, nothing in life is worth doing it. Hi, Claire. Nothing in life is worth doing it if it calls you to burn out your adrenal glands. You know, um, often the burnt out adrenal glands get caught up in being told we have autoimmune issues, thyroid issues. But to me, it's the way you've run your energy field. And you may have been running your energy field like for multi-generational um, timelines. So you may have been running it through past lives, which is nothing to do with multi-generational timelines. Um, but you may have been running it through the ancestral timeline, which will bring in womb trauma, inner child, and just your emotional capacity to deal with life and what life is throwing at you at that time. Now, I think the problem is we sometimes compare ourselves to our friends or to people we see in the media or something. And we think, gosh, you know, how are they coping with that? Because 
I feel overwhelmed with what I'm dealing with in my life at that point in time, or they've got five children and they're running a good career and this and that. And so it's not to compare yourself to other people because remember their emotional matrix inside their energy field, inside the DNA coding may be very, very different to yours. Hi, Philippa, your job is to be honest with yourself. It's no use doing, you know, the Esther and Jerry Hicks, um, you know, thinking positive, wanting to manifest, you know, you can have it all. You can to a degree, but you can't if your emotional matrix causes you to collapse under adrenal fatigue and exhaustion and anxiety. And I think most people's issues are around adrenals and anxiety, and then they crash and burn and they get sick and ill. Your real thing in life is to look at your situation and be adaptable to change. It's not about keeping going if it's starting to cause you stress and anxiety and adrenal fatigue. It's for you to go inside yourself or reach out for professional help with someone like me who can help you identify, you know, what is causing that adrenal fatigue. It's not a failure to rejig your life in any way to make it flow easier. I mean, I think that's what we're all doing. It's like making our lives flow easier in life. And sometimes when you're under stress and anxiety, which ties into yesterday, I spent an hour talking to an undertaker on the phone. Nobody has died yet, but because I sort of had a false alarm around my dad's health last week, and that might be an ongoing thing that we need to look at with him, and he's 92. But I just thought, I don't want to, knowing my myself, knowing where maybe my anxieties might click in, um, knowing an unknown situation, you know, losing a parent to me, I haven't experienced that in this lifetime, that's an unknown situation. I'm aware that I'm going to have to deal with this on my own. Um, and I'm also aware that the more knowledge I have about things makes me feel better because take the example of The Undertaker. So, if a loved one dies, you're going to be in grief and shock and your mind won't be thinking straight. And I know myself, if, if I'm in any form of anxiety, I don't, I won't be able to listen properly. So I thought, I'll ring now while I feel super, you know, balanced, calm, and I can ask questions because you don't get an opportunity to do somebody's funeral again. And so I wanted to know that I was making the right choices for whoever it would that would be passing that I would have to make those choices for and for myself and you know that's how I think other people don't they wait till the disaster happens and then they're like I'll just figure it out now how to deal with that so to me I think differently so <laughs> this undertaker lady was so kind she talked to me for an hour asking her all kinds of questions you know I didn't even know that we could still bury our bodies deep at sea you have to get permission to do it and obviously it costs a certain amount of money but that's an option um that was something that intrigued me so there were lots of things that I asked yes Today that I made notes about that made me feel so comfortable in myself, so happy um, to know that I am full of knowledge, you know, full of knowledge. I also, that this last week, had to finally get my parents to really open up to me about their finances and deal with those kinds of things going forward to be able to assist them. So it's like us having lots of really honest conversations with loved ones and I think that makes your life a lot easier because you're fulfilling what their desires are and you're finding out all this information ahead of time and to me that kind of information brings peace of mind to me and peace of mind takes me out of any anxiety or adrenal fatigue that I might have you know and obviously the week before that I was in Madeira um, and so I had a little bit of I experienced anxiety you know driving up the mountain but it's not a big anxiety it's just observing it in myself observing I do have a small issue I think I talked about this in the other video in a quirky little area you know which is where all our fears and phobias and issues come from some of them are life-threatening and they're huge and 
they need addressing because they're making your life a lot smaller. They're, they're limiting the things you can do in your life. Um, now, should I go to live in somewhere like Madeira? Yeah, probably be a good idea that I just break through that issue of driving around really tight bends really high up. I can walk it and look at, over the cliff edge, but driving, it just, I can feel it. It just like makes me a little bit anxious. Um, and I've had that, you know, experience before in Maui at Haleakala, the highest point on the island where I had that issue. And I had never experienced anxiety like that in my life ever. So to me, there was some value in experiencing that kind of anxiety. Hi, Michelle. Because many of you have anxiety, so I can empathise with what that feeling of anxiety is. It's horrific, you know? It's super horrific. I didn't have it in Madeira, but I had it that time in Maui at Haleakala, the, the park ranger <laughs> had to come. You know, I literally had hired this mystery vehicle in, in Hawaii, which is the other side of the road to the UK, but I'm used to driving on the other side of the road. And I was driving up Haleakala, also linked to this retreat centre I was staying at as well. I got up in the middle of the night and I felt like I was breathing a lot of mould in this retreat centre. And energetically, the guy who was one of the co-owners was sleeping in the room above me and he had really weird energy. Um, so I thought, you know, I'm just going to drive to Haleakala. I'll get there for the sunrise. But I was a little bit spaced out from breathing in this mould, this weird energy coming from him. And as soon as I got to the top, Near the top of the mountain, I felt like, oh, I've got all these cars behind me. I better pull over to let people overtake me. And that was it. In this mystery vehicle, which turned out to be an eight-seater people carrier, um, I thought, I can't, I can't get out. I can't breathe. I feel like the, the whole vehicle's going to drift backwards. And of course, a sacred space like Haleakala is going to bring up stuff that you need to address. So the sacred mountain was already helping me bring up any unresolved issues I had. And it took a park ranger to come. He wouldn't move the vehicle for me, but it was really interesting to see how a man in an authority figure who in that moment was very confident and was like, you can turn this round, you know, I will stop the traffic so that you can turn this car around. And that was it. I had to turn the car around on my own and I got to the ranger station and also the other beauty of it was that at the ranger station the people who gave me their coffee were some um, Jehovah's Witnesses you know and I had a lovely chat with the Jehovah's Witnesses it's not my path it's not my way but it was beautiful that they were in their hearts and they were able to assist me in that moment even though my beliefs were very different to theirs and they didn't try and recruit me um, so that was beautiful so going back to our flexibility to change remember post any questions you have talking about Hawaii reminds me of another friend I have once who when I met them they were living in a friend's pool house um, in Hawaii and I was like what happened they were showing me pictures of this beautiful home they lived in and they'd been um, in construction and the market changed and they didn't have the work and they didn't then have the money to keep up the payments on their mortgage but they had this property prime real estate in um, a Hawaii, uh, let's say Hawaiian island, I don't want to narrow it down to a person, but a Hawaiian island. And to me, that was like, well, if you don't have the money to pay your mortgage, perhaps you should rent the property out as a holiday let or have people come and live in the property with you because you've got you know, spare rooms. You can make this work for you. You don't sit there in terror with no form of income coming in because then what happened was exactly what would happen if you're not flexible to change if you don't think right I'm going to rent this place out I'll go and rent a little studio flat for a while that's not going to cost me so much money that's somewhere much cheaper on the island then I can keep up my payments of my mortgage and all will be good and I can ride out this period of time because everything goes through change you know it's just a period of time but that time might last a year or two or whatever but it's still prime real estate there's still going to be people with money around the world who are going to come to the island going to be able to afford the holiday rental but that's not the choice he made so he lost his house it got repossessed and it was that time in America where a lot of people were very angry because their homes got repossessed and but you the thing is you can have compassion for people but you have to also 
see well what did you do to try to help yourself you know how willing were you to change and look at the bigger picture and i think so many of our issues come from that they come from the lack of our personal ability to take responsibility for ourselves and to be flexible to change to see the bigger picture and sometimes in in yourself you can't see what the answer is so you need to reach out for help for somebody who can either throw ideas at you or can help you go inside yourself to find the authentic self inside you to find the truth inside you to find out what that multi-dimensional authentic version of you thinks might be the best ver best thing to do not what the terrified frightened in a child wants to do because the frightened in a child for that particular person was like i'll just sit down and sit here and wait and and of course nothing's often going to happen when you're in that emotional state of fear and terror or the other version is just deep denial just like if i don't address it and i pretend it's not existing it might just go away you know i'll just do denial 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 and then hopefully it might just go away and the truth of it, that doesn't work either. You know, it's about going through our fears, going through whether we call them the shadow, the pain, the, the pain body, the fear. We've got to transcend our stuff. We can't stay in that fear. And so there I could see with this gentleman, I said, well, did you, did you not think to rent the property out? And he looked at me like, you know, Poof you know, very angry with me because it was obviously a very good idea, but he obviously never thought about it. And obviously the time had passed and now he was homeless, you know. And, um, you know, I don't know what happened to his life in the end. I think he started working again. I, that's the, the, the impression I got and started to turn his life around. Um, so maybe that's the lesson he needed to learn. Maybe somebody like me had to come in and, you know, point out well, you weren't, you weren't flexible to change. And that can be harsh when you have somebody going, ka-ching, ka-ching, here's the truth. You know, this is what you didn't see at the time, but it's not for you to get angry with yourself, um, or to, to, um, almost like get angry with the person sharing the wisdom with you. It's to you to go, oh, have that aha moment and expand the inner self. It's like this week I've worked with a lot of clients and the vibe that's going on at the moment in last week into this week is there are so many people, and I did mention in my last week four video about the Atlantean and the Lemurian mystery schools. And many people are still tied into, because that's where their soul is at, they're tied into mystery schools where um, they have given their power away to the spiritual teacher. And in my own way that I work, I'm constantly looking to make sure that nothing that I'm doing with people is disempowering them. Everything that I'm doing is to empower them back to themselves. Now, some people really struggle to, to be empowered back to themselves. They want somebody to listen to. They want an authority figure to take responsibility for them. That's why we have you know, at the moment, prime ministers, and we have all this Brexit thing going on. It's about the fact that we don't want to necessarily look inside ourselves. And so when you see this going on for people as well, that they're frightened to look inside themselves, but when you do, it's with love and compassion. It's like, okay, so I chose to listen to this spiritual teacher and this is what they said and I ended up giving my power away. Um, I ended up not healing my inner child. I ended up not clearing my past lives. I ended up maybe accessing a past life memory, but just then reliving the same past life again with this teacher. Like sometimes when I look at their Akashic records, you know, they've given away their, their power of self, their authority to these spiritual teachers in previous timelines that are emotionally and energetically still coexisting. So they meet this teacher in this lifetime. There's a resonance of remembrance. And then they're back into giving their power away. You know, they're not taking responsibility for their life. And then, of course, 
all the matrix of whatever the complexities of their unique soul story are with that person and the biggest story of their soul so each person is unique and we have to go into what the minutiae detail of those stories are and many of those teachers like i said in my video that you can watch on youtube on um lemurian atlantis many of those teachers you know, don't get angry with them because very few of them know that they're manipulating people. Very few of them know that they're seeking power from having these followers almost like controlling these people. They don't, they don't know they're doing it and they don't know the dark entities that are maybe coming through their consciousness and nobbling the people and those teachings because they're coming from the false light teachings. So they don't know that. They don't know what's controlling them in the background. They don't, they don't they're unaware of that. So how can you, how can that person be responsible if they don't know what they're doing? If you don't know what you're doing, you can't be responsible. You only become responsible once you have the consciousness to see what you're doing. So it's like self-authority, self-power. Awakening is about taking responsibility for everything that's happening to you. You know, everything that happens to you, the sooner you can go into it and clear it and understand what that message is about, what is it slowing you down to look at what's the bigger story that's unique that's why i keep expressing it's so unique to you there are themes that all of us go through in life to find self-empowerment to find self-authority to find our authentic voice and that's another big thing that i deal with a lot with people which again goes back to what i talked about earlier adrenals autoimmune it's finding your authentic voice the voice that has all the octaves in it, the voice that can be heard on many dimensions of existence, the voice that allows people to hear you, not in a controlling way, in a way that has a resonance that allows you to be heard, that you're not belittled, you're not put down, you don't feel like you have to shout to be heard, you don't feel like you have to over speak all the time um, or you have to I often see people who constantly um, can't hear so they talk over they, they keep talking over because they're still struggling the inner child in them is still struggling to try to get their voice heard you know they didn't have their voice heard in childhood and they haven't healed it yet and when you heal it you won't strain your voice so much um, and again you know when you see the other videos and I think I've talked in the other ones about healing my own throat chakra and coming off thyroxin after being on it for 16 years for an underactive thyroid and that process of going deeply emotionally inside myself it's a journey and I knew to be able to speak the light language and to verbally speak even in this language in the not so much the words I'm saying but the resonance and frequency of what we're speaking with for that to be the most authentic version of me I had to go back into my own Akashic records and I had to heal my throat I had to release any energies that were stuck to my throat chakra any past life beliefs the inner child stuff the ancestral I had to cover the whole smorgasbord of that and it was a journey and it's what do you prioritize in your life you know what's a priority to you what's important to you to heal um yeah Ian's saying most people don't know how to go inside themselves and that is the truth and the thing is if you don't know how to go inside yourself go and do a session with someone like me who can do regression with you R regression is a more focused way of taking you inside yourself where I'm guiding you through emotional events in a very safe very gentle way that so in a way when you do regression you have to find somebody you trust to momentarily give your power away not away in a horrible way in a way that this person is going to help me to walk again it's that kind of energy it's like i have to find somebody i trust but i have to know that that person's energy of intention the person i'm reaching out for help from their intention is to empower me back to myself 
in no way do they want me to become codependent with them or to take responsibility for my life or to control me in any way as long as their whole intention is to empower you back to your to yourself not to manipulate you not to make you feel like you know you have to book 10 sessions with me it's like no you book one and you assess it and you feel how you feel about that and then you decide if you want to do more work i might think gosh i wish they did but i would never vocalize that um it's your free will. That's why I don't like those kinds of ways where people go, okay, you have to book 10 sessions. It, you know, it's gonna take 10 sessions. Um, because there may be people that need 10 sessions, they might need more, but there's gonna be somebody who comes along who perhaps might only need one session for what they're dealing with at that time. And they feel like, you know, I feel like, wow, I'm having to pay all this and only actually need one session. So it's much easier if you can allow people to, again, take responsibility, empower them to go, you will know when you need to do this. There's a tipping point when you clear out enough of your emotional energy that you know what you need to do. You know, you know when you need to reach out for help. You're empowered enough to do that. And most people, again, like Ian said, it takes time to know how to go inside yourself. And it also takes self-authority to actually reach out for help to go, you know what, I can't actually do this on my own. The truth is, I can't, I can't do this on my own. I need help. You know, it's like me, I, I did, I practically healed it 100% now, but um, I did my shoulder in from doing too many somersaults, doing aerial yoga about a month ago now. And I knew I need to reach out for help from a great guy who's an activator chiropractor um, because it was inside, really inside there. And it was great, you know, he helped me. He strapped it, put this cute Barbie pink tape on to hold it in place. And I took it off this morning after two weeks. Um, and I might reach out for help from an osteopath because they might have some knowledge that I need to, but I'm visualizing it, I'm resting it, I'm taking it inside myself. You know, I'm asking, is there an emotional link to this or is this like a lot of people say, this particular issue that I had with the AC and the rotator cuff in your arm was just from extreme sports, you know, which aerial yoga, I love it as much as I do, is an extreme sport. So. We learn, we learn from experience. And then it made me look at my dad and I think my dad at 92 has no bodily issues in joints or anything like that. And he's never done a day of exercise in his life, you know. Um, so it does make me see that actually, um, you know, if you engage in extreme sports, you're gonna be pulling the body in ways that may not be natural for it. It's not natural necessarily to do some of these things to an extreme level um so maybe assessing that looking at that looking at the wisdom of somebody who's 92 and their body is in good shape so so many interesting things for us to consider in ourselves does anybody have a question hi tina hi janie um do you have a question we can talk about any subjects you like I mean, predominantly today, I've been talking about cause and effect of taking responsibility for our lives, which in truth is the hardest thing ever for most people to do is to take responsibility for yourself, um, take responsibility for your actions and um, the actual joy that comes from actually realizing, you know, if I take responsibility for this, this might actually help my anxiety or my fear or my guilt or whatever it is, because everything we're looking to do is to clear those Akashic records or to overcome a new experience that you don't have the skill set necessarily to do. So you have to go through that experience where it might be quite uncomfortable for a while because we're going through this new experience that we've not had before. And it's often that fear of the unknown. How am I gonna deal with the fear of the unknown? Um, but you will, you will transcend it. And you can't just stay in your comfort zone because life, will get boring you know we're here to 
have new experiences, try new things. And of course they have a cause and effect, but we can ultimately go in the body and heal ourselves. That's our journey, that's our ability to do that. You know, that's everything that I've done for the last 19 years on myself and helping others is to go inside myself, heal everything that comes up um, and move beyond that. Was Atlantis the most enlightened civilization we have had? And if so, what went wrong? Um, it seems like, I think Lemurian timelines, I think there's many differing layers of Atlantean timelines. I've heard some people saying there were three periods of Atlantis. So there are timelines upon timelines. I think it was quite advanced. I think we had technology that got shut down that we haven't used now. Um, obviously, you know, you can look at all these um, sacred things. I think I talked about these in other videos like Gold Bay Tepe and, you know, which is in Turkey, um, Easter Island, the pyramids, Chichen Itza, you know, the Bosnian pyramids. There was all kinds of technology going on from different off-world species of ET that were using these pyramids for something that the vast majority of humanity just think are burial chambers, you know? Um, and, you know, they're, they're being told, uh, you know, a story that might not be the absolute truth, and then that's your discernment of what you believe it to be truth. But I think we have lived in a more highly civilized, evolved consciousness than we live in at this point in time. But I think galactic wars took place. I think different beings came in and took over the consciousness of the humans and the DNA codes were changed. Um, ultimately, it seems that the Earth is a planet of free will and choice. Um, and it allows you to have these experiences. It's a planet of basically non-interference, as in you can connect with the version of you that might be a more evolved being, might be a multi-dimensional being. And that to me is the journey that we're on, is to reclaim all those soul shards of ourselves and ascend into the body, through the body, to ascend through our physical body. No, there's no such thing as failure. There's just experience. Is the earth splitting into um, two earths, you know, one staying in 3D, or is there another planet that's, 3D consciousness, is it inside you? You know, is consciousness inside you? Um, so it's really important that you do the inner work on yourself. You can listen to me, you can listen to other people, but you have to go, does that, has a, does that have a resonance for me? Is what that person talking about something in my personal soul Akashic records that resonates for me? It's not about other people, it's about does that work for me? Is there a truth in me linked to those timelines? It's like I look at so many women um, and I just see them, um, not in a horrible way, but I just see they're tied into manipulation and corruption of the Egyptian timelines. They're still tied into those um, mystery schools that, in my opinion, lack integrity, they're still tied into the stories around jealousy, around fear, around corruption of power, um, and I see that they're working through that. Maybe maybe it doesn't look like they're working through it, maybe it looks like they're just reliving it, so they all go in big groups off to Egypt again, and <laughs> You know, they just do the same thing they were doing in the past lives. And um, they don't look in great health or well-being necessarily. And they're not doing emotional inner journey work in themselves. Um, they think they are because they're doing a lot of ceremonies. It's all about ceremonies and they're connecting to these earth grids in some ways. But they're not really looking deeply at their own inner child, their own wounding, their own ancestral stuff. They really overlook all of this. They just don't do that. They just go around the world. I think with the ETs, maybe the entities that, that have hijacked their consciousness on a way and they're just siphoning off loosh, which is life force energy off them when they go to these sacred sites. 
and they don't really understand what's happening. Now, some of them might go and use this as a trigger to go, oh my God, I remember I've done this before, I'm gonna take my power back, I'm not giving away, giving my power away to this again. Um, you know, and but you have to be so discerning to be able to see that. And so many people on this planet are still abusing their power, you know. But can they be responsible for what they're doing? Not if they can't see themselves. If they can't see themselves and they can't see what they're doing and you of your own free will felt like, oh, I need to go with this group to Egypt or whatever and um, try and figure out your past lives. If you, you know, you could just reach out for help and go inside yourself and clear that. But some of you need to go back there to have the memory triggered in you. And even then some of you will go and still not get the memory triggered in you. Um, because like the way the matrix of energy works, if you're not prepared to look at everything, if you're not prepared to look at inner child stuff, you're not prepared to look at ancestral stuff, and you're not prepared to look at past lives, or you think, oh, I'm prepared to look at, at this, but uh, I don't believe in that. Like, you know, mainstream therapy might allow them to look a little bit at the inner child, but not too deeply. They think they found a fragmented five-year-old and, oh, I've done inner child therapy. I reclaim my five-year-old. Yeah, well, what about all the other bits? Maybe, maybe there's more. And they go, oh, well, you know, and often I see people going, oh, I thought I'd heal my inner child. I'm like, mm-hmm. And, you know, it is what it is. People are where they're at. And there's no such thing as failure. There's just experience. Um, has anybody got any other questions? Um, if you do, pop them there. I hope that's answered some of what I'm, what I'm saying. And... You know, you do have Stargate portals within you. So within the cellular memory, sometimes you do need to go to places in the world, you know, whether it's Egypt. I had to go there a lot. I spent from about 2005 until I was 40. Um, so, yeah about a good five or six years going to Egypt three times a year on my own um I think I went once with a friend and you know I had to go through the process of whatever I was doing there and then for my 40th birthday I was guided to sleep looking into the sphinx so the paws would be either side and I would be sleeping looking into the sphinx and there was only one place in Egypt to stay where you can look into the paws of the Sphinx <laughs> and that was quite an experience staying there with the guy who owned the hotel and his wife his wife was you know very kind um, you know their way of living is very different than maybe my way of living and it turned out that was actually the only person staying there at the time and that came with quite an experience <laughs> and um, <laughs> I have talked about this story and I do talk about it in private workshops and um, I think I won't put it on the record of, of what happened there. Uh, but let's put it this way. I took my power and authority back from, from people who um, probably thought that they could get away with doing what they've been doing for a long, long time. And so um, it didn't quite work out as what I thought I was going there for but in truth it did because I took my power back um it had a huge impact on me I had food poisoning for about three weeks after <laughs> um but I spoke my truth and I took my power back to the people that I needed to do it to and these were important important people there energetically in Egypt and their ancestral timeline and they recognised me and I recognised them energetically when I got there, well, even before I got there, because when I connected with them on social media, I felt emotion before I even went there and they invited me to go and stay there. Um, and it was really very challenging and it was really about the nuances of discernment and taking your power back and... Um, and, and judgment calls and making the right judgment calls and using my discernment to sometimes speak out, sometimes not speak out because it might not have been the right time to do those things. And ultimately, I, I worked on many multidimensional levels um, and I ended up going to 
Saqqara, which is the other Egypt, just the, the other pyramids, sorry, just outside um, Cairo, which are healing sound temples there as well. And um, yeah, just reconnecting with those. And, and I did actually make some videos of that. And I think they're on a flip camera. I may have got them somewhere. I can maybe upload them at a later date. But yeah, it's, you know, going on your own a bit <laughs> You know, when I was younger, I was still blonde, but, you know, mumbling around Egypt on your own um, and uh, holding your light, holding your authority, holding your own energy in those experiences is quite challenging and coming out of them. You know, and I have many experiences around the world doing that because I travel on my own all the time, you know, even from being quite young. And um, I would always put myself in, you know, experiences. I can remember another time in Egypt going there and um you know talking to some local men and hanging out with them you know and off in a car with them you know and ended up in a in a egyptian bar full of old men playing dominoes drinking celeb which is this like milky drink that they all drink and that was probably when i was about 30 ish i did that and i was safe as could be you know i was really safe and i can remember horse riding bare back in in Egypt in the desert and um, with this guy who was an amazing horse teacher it's like a horse whisperer he's just amazing and he gave me this bracelet and I thought oh my god I could be married in Egypt I don't even know what this bracelet symbolizes or means and um, when I was in the car with these guys they were like you know if if the patrol people ask just say you're my wife and I'm thinking okay and um but nothing happened to me and they were the kindest people they wouldn't even let me pay for dinner and yet obviously the value of their money compared to my money you know they were like no 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 you know I, I I pay for everything they were just super kind lovely people and so it's really about discernment and trusting your own experiences um Deborah's asking are Anna am I rubbing gosh blah, 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 blah. am I running any workshops this year yeah I probably will be I'm very last minute I hate I have this thing in myself I hate commitment too far ahead of time and I know that's a struggle for people and that's why you know I am taking hopefully although I'm leaving it to the 11th hour but I did book my flight a long time ago I have booked to be in the Cathar region in France and if you go on my website the dates are on my website the end of April um, to and I'm happy to take people around there the retreat center I did try to book isn't open until May uh, but I booked my flights you'll see the dates of my flights in April um, so I might get my head around that this week I'm very last minute and I know that doesn't help some people because some of you feel you have a regular job and you need to find that time off work or you have commitments and family or you feel you need to save financially to, to go to events. So I am aware of that and it is a challenge for me and I do try to do my best. Um, I usually always do a workshop for the solstice, um, which obviously is always the same date, more or less. And whether it's a, a weekday or a weekend, I always hold it on the date of the solstice and usually that is in Glastonbury it might be Cornwall I'll tune in this year but I usually do an event for the solstice but I think because I'm so intuitive and I'm so guided to do things in the moment you know I just do them and if only if <laughs> if because they're only in the moment that means only x amount of people can show up that's what it is you know um I would love to give you huge amounts of time and organization but, you know, sometimes that doesn't really work for people. I know the third dimensional reality it works for because logistics, people think I have to do this, this and this and this and this. But actually, sometimes, especially if it's in the UK, if you can just trust to the flow and just just do that, you will change the course of your life and you will get out of a rut of how you think life has to be if you can just go with the flow of whatever. Now I know that that causes a lot of people a lot of fears and anxieties, um, but actually for me, that makes my life actually easier to just flow like that. I know there are little things we have to put in the diary and, and be committed to, but for me, 
if you have too many commitments in your diary, life cannot happen. If you have committed to too many things, you cannot be available for intuition, you cannot be available for change and flow. Um, so that's, to me, an important aspect of it. Um, somebody's written something else. Um, what about military children? We have no roots, no ancestral home, just constant move after move. Um, it, that's, a, that's a good question, Deborah. I mean, I was looking at my own life. I was braying like a horse there. <laughs> I'm not a military child, although my dad was in the Navy and Army, um, and we talked about that the other day, but he was called up, it was not through choice, he was in the Navy much later, because um, he chose to be in the Navy, and then they moved him into the Army, which he didn't like so much, and he was travelling, but that was before he got married and before he had me. Um, I always lived in the same house, so... Um, I don't know, if your family kept moving, your grounding is you know, that unit of people, or you're actually very good at, at being flexible to change, you know, how that lifestyle will have affected you will be different than maybe how it's affected somebody else. So you can't say a blanket, all people who come from military background, and of course, you know, there's lots of other things within the military experience that could have affected you or might not have affected you, it's unique to you. Um, but that, fa that feeling of not having any grounding home um, will be maybe where did your grandparents live? You know, where were those kinds of ancestors from? Where were you actually born at that time? Because where you were born at that time is like a Stargate portal for where you came to the planet. Um, and maybe now as an adult, it's important for you not to travel. You know, I have been personally, my own experience of life, you know, I looked at this the other day, my dad was always traveling in his working, you know, sailing on ships all around the world, or, you know, even from being called up, he was in Italy and Greece. Um, so I love living out of a suitcase, that suits me. You know, I've even got one on the floor now. <laughs> if, you, if you saw him, there's a big suitcase, which I haven't quite unpacked. But it's like, I personally live my life ever since when I was modeling, I would always have a, you know, I'd be always ready to go somewhere. You know, since I was 18, I have been living, traveling out of a suitcase. And then there's times when I go, okay, I need to stay home for a month or two or not go anywhere. And then I'm like, oh no, need to pop off somewhere. So I think that's it. It's like, it's unique to you, Deborah. You've got to find out, you know, that requires the emotional inner work to you. It's speaking to the inner child in you, finding out what her core beliefs are about this experience. You know, how does it feel? How can you release the emotion around that story of feeling like you don't have a home, you don't have a base, you know, your home could be, you know, I don't know if you're single or if you have a partner or your children, you know, that can be home for you. Home can be people, but ultimately our home energetically is inside ourselves, you know. Um, I, I, that's why I travel the world and I feel, oh, feel home here, feel home here, feel home here. You know, there's some, my actual physical home where I was born and where I go to visit my parents feels the least like home. I don't really particularly like so much that town and that part of the country energetically. I don't enjoy it that much. I go to other places and I feel, oh, I feel at home here, I feel expansive you know like the people love the energy love the positivity so home is where you feel happy in you so do we have any other questions thanks for staying watching I know it's a long time for some people um yeah, I am, Philippa, thank you. Yeah, I am going to run a workshop in the Cathar region when I'm there. Uh, I need to get organised, that's the thing. Logistics, like I said before. Um, that's my intention. My intention is to run a workshop and to um, activate the Stargate portals in ourselves by going to the sacred sites that I'm guided within myself energetically. I can see it where to take people. And because I've been going a lot, over the last few years to the Cathar region. So we'll be going to like Mossiga, we'll spend some time in Rene Laban, um, bathing in the thermal spa, water in the river. I'm gonna take you to a forest where there's like massive megalithic stones. A lot of people take people to this chair of Isis, which 
I know where it is. It's, it's, it's the entrance to a beautiful forest, but it's not powerful in my mind you know it is if you're in the corrupted timelines but it's not in the other timelines so it's to go there and see how it makes you feel see what experiences you have there are some other places there there's Bugarash there's um there's another place which is sometimes a place I've stayed um which is called Laval Dieu which is in the middle of this energy template grid between René Le Ban and um René Le Chateau as well um so obviously to take people to René Le Chateau as well uh so yeah let me see if there's some accommodation place I did think about you know should I rent a place where we could all be together or should I allow you to just find your own accommodation and um, you know just give you times to show up at these places I personally am flying to Bezier. you can fly to Carcassonne again that's another place I like to go to Carcassonne on the way which is a beautiful place where there's the big medieval castle um if you're interested message me and I will rustle something up in my own unique way of rustling things up and those of you who've been to my events know it always pans out it's always great it always comes together um so I will ponder on that this week and um thank you Philippa oh thanks that you think it sounds amazing yeah I think it will I can energetically kind of tune into it now and I can energetically see what we would be doing and it would be quite powerful i get so regenerated by going to this forest that i'm telling you about and connecting with these stones these stones are like so powerful in this forest there um often i've laid there you know i just stumbled upon these things the thing is nobody nobody really showed me where these things are there is a magdalene cave i've been to before um that's what they call it i tend to not focus on that that timeline too much um and it was a lovely cave, you know. <laughs> I had to crawl under some barbed wire and through a field somewhere. And um, it was lovely. And I think I have posted a picture in the past of being there and I lost my hat there. Um, but I lost my hat in a restaurant in, I think, <laughs> René Le Pan. Um, and I do love this other place in René Le Pan to stay. And the ladies just sold it um, where I used to stay there. Um, so, yeah, let's just tune into that and see see what goes on. And found anything good to watch on I don't watch Gaia I don't watch Gaia TV um so sorry about that Ian but I don't watch Gaia TV um it's not something I'm drawn to uh yeah that's just how it is um let's see I think that's what he means when he said Gaia sorry don't watch Gaia TV um so do we have any other questions for today or shall I just kind of um yeah we'll do more on another week so this is week five we talked a little bit about the Cathar region um it is powerful going to the Cathar region the first time I went it did trigger a memory of being a Cathar I was in Carcassonne and we were on this horse and cart in this lifetime and, and she was just about to talk about and this is where they hung the cathars and I, I was already seeing myself on the cart in the past life but I was so in that energy of being a cathar that I was like mm, whatever you know it doesn't bother me if they kill me and I think that's another interesting thing that when I take people back to past lives it's not so much what happens to you it's your perception of it you know often when I've taken people and they've been say a temple maiden and of course if the priestess that you worked for died you would be should be put in this burial chamber with food and usually a temple maiden to go with her into the next world of whatever they believe that would be into the afterworld um so one of the temple maidens what i've seen in regression in taking clients into regression is a temple maiden would would go with the body of the priestess to the to the next world and they would shut the stone and you would be locked in there and basically when you ran out of air you would you as the temple maiden would die now i've seen you know 
people in regression going clawing at the at the wall to get out really angry i don't want to die for this woman you know i, I this is not great this is crap i don't want this you know really angry and then i've seen somebody else almost going through a very mirrored past life experience and they're in a whole other space you know they're like it is an honor for me to die for the priestess and i think i'd seen the one where she was clawing at the walls first um and then helping her release the trauma and emotion of that but the one who i was like oh wow here we are similar situation yet completely other perspective a completely different perspective of a very similar life um, but her feeling, no, she felt in her heart, she felt privileged, she felt honoured that she'd been chosen to be the temple maiden to guide the priestess who she loved to the next world and she would die with her and that would be their journey and she was cool with that. So it's really a unique perspective of, and that's why I always say it's not what happens to you in life, it really is the narrative and story that you believe in yourself and your emotional reaction to what you're experiencing you know and so maybe at the end of that life i would have said to her well that was wonderful but you don't necessarily you know we would find out the matrix of why she'd seen that lifetime you don't necessarily need to die for somebody else anymore um for the other lady it would be about you know you can lose all the anger about dying for someone that was an experience you had and you're not living that experience now we can release all that what did you learn from that experience same to the other person what did you learn what did you learn it's not it's not always me projecting what you could learn although i can overview it and look at what you're experiencing in this lifetime and compare it to that lifetime and then do a resolution of that lifetime but also your own words are really important the words that you your core belief about those experiences of lifetimes and that's I think the thing about the Cathar lives, it's very important to see that. And when I went with a friend, actually, I think we went twice, a friend of mine. We went to this other place called Arquez, um, which is just outside. It's a beautiful chateau, just outside um, René Levin. And um, when we got there, I said to Shwet is closed. I said, don't worry, we'll go in round the back. <laughs> And um, we'll get in under, under, around the back. And she's like, how do you know I went? But because I lived here before. And she went, oh, I think I did too. And then I could see my past life, actually one of my happy lives. Um, I think I'd been in love with this guy then. I could see him spinning me round, twirling me round in this, in this chateau. Anyway, we went round the back and it was exactly what I could see, this kind of way into this chateau. And we got in even though it was closed at the front. We didn't have to pay and uh, we just climbed in over this brick wall under this barbed wire again but she was like sobbing because she was saying she'd been a man in that lifetime and she'd given her daughter away to be married it wasn't me um to somebody who i then she felt was the wrong man you know she she'd allowed her daughter to marry a man who wasn't maybe the right the right person and she felt a lot of guilt around that so that was interesting experience to have um so you know that's what happens it can trigger the memory for you can trigger either seeing it energetically or emotionally connecting into it but it's not to dwell on it it's to clear this out of your akashic records clear 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 the akashic records out so you, you're not really in those anymore um hi pauline um so i think we're going to wrap it up for today thank you so much for listening and um we will be doing wisdom on a wednesday another week hopefully maybe next week we shall see um if you've enjoyed this and my battery's going now so please go to my website which is andreafaux.com i obviously in this i've spoken about doing workshops and i'm open to giving workshops and talks wherever um in the world it feels appropriate if you want to invite me and um i do skype sessions daily on emotional akashic records and uh, i also do regression one-to-one -one sessions and as you've seen i do do workshops as well and many of you have been on some of those and we probably will be doing one for the solstice and probably before then and obviously the april trip to the cathar region um, so much love for today, many blessings and have a wonderful day. And if you want to experience some of the light language codes, they are also for free on YouTube. Um, so many thanks and much love. And I'm sorry I was a bit late today, but um, 
we had a beautiful time together so thank you for watching